Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dilta Daherty and in this podcast series, I will be interviewing investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we will be discussing how to set up, scale and operate a world-class recruitment company. Today, you're in for a treat. I am joined by Joe Mullings. He is a recruitment entrepreneur, search business owner, and he is based in Palm Beach, Florida. He has a medium-sized firm, so he's about 29 people working for him, and they're bringing in about eight and a half million a year. And now what sets his firm apart from other ones in the marketplace is seven of his staff members are digital media specialists. And his whole process is about how he's embraced content and digital marketing, but also kept the traditional tools alive of using the phone, but only he prefers to use it in a smarter way in that, you know, everything they do is based on them building awareness so that whenever they do make the call, it's a lot easier than it would have been otherwise. And he'd gone into how he went about that and his backstory beforehand. So hope you all enjoy. Hello? Joe Mullings, how are you today? Good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on. Really do. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I heard you on the Animal Show and I was super impressed. I thought to myself, he's saying the stuff I wish I had said instead of pulling a complete blank and getting absolutely hammered by Animal on us. <laughs> <laughs> they 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 don't give uh, much space the second that they can feel a little weakness they do pounce for sure but i think he's doing a service to the business right i i appreciate his show yeah yeah it, he he puts he put he positions it well he gives you every chance to hang yourself and <laughs> some of so, some people like yourself come a cut come out of it unscathed so <laughs> i thought his listenership is uh is a lot of independent recruiters in the US. Yeah. So I thought yeah. it would be great to get you on here and share your story with our UK audience. Excited to do so. Okay, so I, I have given everybody a bit of an introduction to you, but if you could let me know, I suppose an interesting way for this to start would be, give me a snapshot of what your business is today in terms of size, revenue, what you do, where you're located. Sure. So we're in, uh, down in Palm Beach, Florida, uh, on the East coast of the U S. Uh, we currently are about a 29 person search firm of which seven of those are, uh, agency people, which would deploy our media, our digital media. We'll get into that. Uh, but the ba- there's three in operations, and the balance of the organization are recruiters working desks. Um, we specialize in the medical device industry, life sciences, biotech. Uh, annualized, we're at a run rate of about uh, 8.5 million U- U.S. per year. Um, our average fee is about 40 to 45 thousand dollars American. Uh, we work all functions within the medtech industry, design, development, quality, regulatory, general management, C-suite, what have you. Uh, been at it for 28 years. Became a recruiter December 4th, 1989. Brilliant. My own firm in January of 1992. Okay, great. Walk me through those early days. How did you get into recruitment? I went to school. I got a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Dayton, Ohio in 1984. I went to work um, because I read the handbook of life, you know, get, go to college, get a job, get married, and then, um, you know, just become an automaton the rest of your life. Well, that didn't work out real well. I spent just a couple of years in engineer very early in. I knew I did not want to work for a corporation. Uh, I was an entrepreneur, built a couple of businesses, sold them for a lot of money, took some time off, lived on a boat with my dog. 
uh, brain started to turn to mush, went into a friend of the family's headhunting business, asked him to find me a job. After about two hours of talking to him, he asked me if I was interested in doing what he did for a living. I said, how much did his top salesperson make? He told me what he made. I said, when can I start? So that's how I got involved in search. What do you think it was about you that wasn't suited to the corporate world? Uh, I don't like to be told what to do. Um, very plain and simple. Um, always been an entrepreneur. Um, always willing to work harder than everybody else. In fact, my very first day on my job as an engineer, I worked through lunch and two of the senior people came over to me and told me I can't do that. I have to take my lunch. Um, it's not appreciated that I'm working through my lunch. And right there and then, I knew I wasn't cut for that that type of business. Okay. So so those early days in recruitment, what year was that? That was 19, uh, 1991, did you say? No, uh, December 4th, 1989 was 89. my first day. Yep. So 99, oh. 90, 91, which were tough years in the business. What was recruitment like back then? Because that's, that's around the dot-com dot com era, right? Uh, yeah, even before that. No, no, way, way before that because um, we, we mailed resumes, so we didn't even have a fax machine. Um, we certainly didn't have computers. We worked out of um, index cards in a uh, little plastic container. You got these books that were sick codes, mm. and based on four codes, you knew what they made and what industry they were in, and you were given a book with the name of the company, the phone number, and basically what they made. And you called up the switchboard and you got through to somebody. And yeah. that's literally how you did search. Is this real Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Oh, yeah. In fact, funny you say that. When I opened my firm, your very first day in our firm back then, you watched that scene with Alec Baldwin. That was the very <laughs> first scene you watched. <laughs> that's a great scene, by the way. Yeah, it is. Um, okay, so... Obviously an entrepreneur. Yeah. You do two years working for somebody. Yeah. What were the decisions that led you to setting up your own search firm? Or did you go into that firm knowing that once you got that process done, it was highly likely you would go out on your own? Um, the gentleman who hired me, Sebastian Lavolsi, um, God bless him. Um, great man. When he hired me, I told him I was only going to work with him for two years. And that I would be opening my own firm. That's ballsy, he, isn't it? Yep. And he looked at me and he said, Joe, if you're able to leave and have enough money to open up your own firm, I'll support you. Uh -huh. And again, he was a friend of the family. So there's a little nepotism there. Um, two, if it, two years and two weeks to the day, I, I told Seb I'm out. He sent me away with my database and let me open my office down in Miami, Florida. Now, footnote, I heard his office... I heard he was closing his office about 15 years later. Um, I called him up and I said, I heard your office is for sale. He said, it's not for sale. I'm just closing it. I said, no, I heard it's for sale. Uh, I flew up to Northport, Long Island, and I stroked him a check large for over six figures or large six figures as a way to say thank you and bought his database and never made a placement out of it. Wow. That was, uh, that, that was, that was very big. It was very big of you. No, if a cocky kid came and said the same thing to you now, would you punch him in the face? Um, I would giggle. Um, <laughs> I would giggle and then ask him to make it through the interview process. And then af if after two years, he felt like he could build a firm better than the one that he was in, um, then I would, I would take a bet on him or her. Um, if they were good enough to make it through our interview process. And if after two years... Um, he or she actually could do it better than I can. I don't think I could stop that person from going to do their thing. But I would remind them that an owner is different than a billing desk. Mm. We'll jump into that, shall we? What, what, what do you mean by that exactly? So when I got into the business, or maybe some of your listeners did, it was literally a phone. And as I said, you know, we, we mailed resumes and eventually got a fax. And it was, it was a low overhead business. Um, all you needed was the phone and, and, and a good shtick. I believe, um, as recent as the last few years, most of the industry has not realized that there's been a tectonic shift in the way the business is done. And it's okay if you still do it the old way, 
and you're only going to be in the business for a couple more years. Um, and you want to have a practice, which is cool. One or two desk office, make your 150 to 200 American a year. But if you plan on building a firm and you are not, not already indexing towards a major um, media strategy to augment, not to replace, to augment and enhance the skills at a desk level, you're going to get crushed. And we will jump into that, I promise, because I've got a ton of questions on that. But walk me through those early days. You're a young, cocky guy. You've got a few pound in your pocket. You've, uh, you've set up. Have you set up by yourself? Um, is it just you? Have you gone in with somebody else? Have you rented an office? Are you doing it from home? Like, set that scene for me. Sure. So um, my college roommate, Jim Weber, was living in Europe. He was over in Germany selling cars, military overseas sales, the gray market in cars. He made a bunch of money. He was coming back. He asked me to find him a job. He heard, he and I discussed that I was opening up my own search business. Um, he said, let's be partners because he's the only other person I know on earth personally that has as solid and insane and sacrificial of a work ethic as I do. So we both threw in about $58,000 each American. We secured an office down in Coral Gables, Florida. We joined what at that point was a franchise business called Management Recruiters. And we opened up our office. Um, we uh, about It was about 1,000 square feet. And we knew we wanted to build a firm rather than just make a lot of money. Um, so we did what everybody else did. You know, you work 20 hours a day. Um, you, you, you battled your way. You built your database, your client base. And after about two and a half years, we split. We had differing philosophies in the business. Um, I went my way. He went his way. Uh, we still do split business today and are good friends today. That's amazing. Okay, so um, why did you buy a franchise? Why didn't you just set up? Because I came out of a management recruiter's office, management recruiter's franchise in the States here. Uh, and in my very first year, I was top 10 out of 5,000 people. So I figured out the game. And of course, they gave me the verbal blowjobs and told me how great I was. And they tell me I'll be able to scale out and have this great organization and be able to, you know, move thousands, which I always wanted to do. I always looked at search different. So I signed up for the franchise. It was great. And again, you know, they made me the, the queen of the ball as a very, very, very young guy in an old person business. But after paying seven and a half percent royalties over about six years or so, I was looking at how much money I was giving away. And I was actually ahead of the business. I mean, we we used Lotus Notes and optical character recognition on resumes before anybody ever thought of it in the search business. We wrote our own software. So we were using that kind of scanning technology before everybody else. And after a while, we were just doing it totally different than they were. I, I bought myself out of my uh, franchise and then went independent. All right. Walk me through how you scaled up in terms of numbers. And did you peak at any stage? Did, uh, did the recession affect you? Uh, when, when did you see Le LinkedIn and the recruitment market shift a little bit? So, you know, I, I started when Jim and I split um, two of the – uh, recruiters came with me. And again, I always knew I wanted to grow an office um, because I want to develop people, not because I wanted to make more money, but I wanted to change the game. I knew in, in, inherently I, I, I was wired to change the game. So I knew that I had to be a big biller, meaning book business, and then give it to people in my office to let them get their legs, get, let them get their chops, make money, um, make sure that they were successful. I think the shift, the first shift came when I realized you shouldn't hire people for the lowest amount of money you can get away with paying, because that's what you end up getting from a skill set. Sure, every once in a while, you'll get some outlier that you can get away with a commission draw on. But our first major shift in the way we were able to scale quickly was we gave first year guarantee salaries. 2x, two times what the industry norm was. Because my philosophy was, I can book the business, but I want best athlete. Because if you give me best athlete and I put them through the right training and they're wired right, they're going to come up to speed a lot quicker. Therefore, I'm not going to spend a lot of time hiring, training, firing, hiring, training, firing. A very brutal cycle that kills most search firms. So that was the first 
aha moment we had. It meant I made less money in the beginning, but what I did was I built out a critical mass of recruiters on the floor that were tied to me and realized that we did it different. And that philosophy carried over. Then, then Monster came around. That was always an interesting time. Um, but the real shift was LinkedIn. I did not realize how powerful LinkedIn. In fact, I used to prohibit my recruiters from spending time on LinkedIn and told them to get on the goddamn phone because they were spending too much time looking at a screen. But a couple of years ago, I realized that you could scale your messaging at LinkedIn if done properly. And that's when the second major shift happened in our business about three and a half, four years ago. Fantastic. OK, let's jump into the first part of that. Uh, it sounds like you've got a stringent interview process when you bring people on board. What are the kind of lessons that you've learned over the years in, in, in kind of identifying like who is going to be a top performer from those that maybe they should just go work for Kelly services. Yeah. Good question. Um, so our interview process is nine gates and it's six in-person interviews. Um, and you know, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but it's, um, it's two telephone interviews. Cause if you're not good on the phone, you're not going to be good in this business. So that's one. Then it's uh, two in persons with two of the senior partners here. There's a cognitive intelligence test. You come back again and you meet half the senior team. You come back again, meet the other half of the senior team. And then your final interview is a presentation that you can present on anything you want, but you're going to have to stand up under direct fire in front of seven or eight people to see how you handle respectfully being put off balance. And then if that works out, then typically you get an eighty to $100,000 starting salary here um, coming into the organization. So that's our interview process. The people who make it really um, make it through have a high level of um, mental, physical, and spiritual endurance, um, always index above 120 IQ, um, and have been through something quite um, life-changing um, in their existence, uh, a death, a divorce, um, being fired, uh, being broke, being arrested. Um, but have worked through something that was major adversity. I don't want to be your first shot on goal at adversity because this is going to be the most brutal job you ever had in a very positive way. Yeah, it, I think grit is the outcome that you're looking for. Yeah, grit with elegance and intelligence because I know a lot of people who have grit who probably couldn't do effectively because, um, again, the IQ, the, I can't fix stupid and I can't fix dumb. Um, and I can't fix lazy. So um, <laughs> those things we interview for, and we actually tell people that we, we are letting you interview us because we're going to set such a high bar, you're going to decide if you want to step into this or not. It's a different perspective. I can see your engineer brain coming out oh, yeah. in, a, in, a, oh, yeah. in a lot of the stuff that you do, um, which, which is kind of, it, it makes this conversation a, a little different to, to how it normally goes which is great. Um, I'm not going to ask you about the monster piece because LinkedIn's taken over that. So yeah, yeah. it was a bit of a waste of time at the start, but there came a point when you figured out how you could do it at scale. Are you able to kind of jump into that a bit more? Sure. So, you know, if you think about search, it's a very analog function. It's one phone call. It's one point of contact, one point of influence. And if the recruiter's really good, he or she is able to influence the person to consider looking at the opening that you're doing a search on. And so you're, you're tied by a linear scale there in, in being able to influence. And I looked at that and I said, okay, let's hold on a second. If, if the message we're delivering is really good and we know our industry, how do I do this at scale and keep it a very high engaging, um, um, intimate though at the same time? So we, about three and a half years ago, coming on four, maybe eventually, we decided to scale out digitally on LinkedIn and build out a um, major organization within our organization that we call the agency that delivers content that we were delivering on the telephone to individuals, but now we package it in video, short form, long form video, short form we call breadcrumbs online, and then long form articles. Because we believe that 
if we show a body of work, like a compelling body of work, that we will have instant gravitas when we eventually do get on the phone. But I can get four, five, six thousand views of a piece of content of mine in less than 24 hours. That then allows people to lean into us and say, I want to talk to you, Mullings. Or when one of my 20 search consultants call, there's instant gravitas and it's no longer a cold call. They're like, oh, you're with Mullings or you with the Mullings group. Yeah, I already know in my head you're an expert in the area of my um, uh, uh, career. Okay. Walk me through the steps that it took for you to come about with that strategic plan. Like, Okay. Um, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny quick story. So I said, okay, I got to do video. Right. And so I, I got a little Sony uh, handheld. I went out in my office at home. I set it up. I uh, did a direct to camera pitch on why you want to work with us as a recruiter. I was really proud of it. I ran into the other room, showed it to my wife. She looked at it and she goes, you look fucking ridiculous. You look like a prisoner in an occupation camp. I'm like, what? This is gold. She says, it's absolutely ridiculous. You're going to you're going to embarrass yourself. Call up your nephew, Ryan, who went to film school and ask him about what you should be doing. So I called my nephew up and that led to me hiring him and two of his um, classmates who graduated in film. They were my first effort. I, I committed, you know, we committed over a hundred and something thousand dollars in salaries to bring them in and gear. And we brought them in. And for the first year and a half, two years, I had to sit in and taste everything. I had to understand video. I had to understand how to influence people. I had to understand what didn't work. My earlier stuff looks a lot different than it does today. Um, and then they went their way. They were artists. They weren't necessarily sure. corporate people. And then we went out and just uh, about eight months ago brought in Emmy Award winner, Peabody Award winner, storyteller who's worked for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who's worked for uh, 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 Jimmy Carter. We got another guy who's my director of photography, who has worked in NFL films, NASCAR, reality shows. So we, we, we went out after we knew this was it and we threw – um, major resources at scale. We have an in-house studio here. Um, and again, I think our spend is north of 600000 a year in media agency efforts. Okay, that's incredible. Now, can I jump back in? For those of us who don't have Ryan as a nephew yeah, and don't have a massive budget, what, yeah. what were the kind of lessons that he was giving you on what makes a good video and what are the type of things that you need to be doing to engage with the audience in, in the right manner? Was there any takeaways that, that, that you could let us know about? Yeah. If I was, if I was writing a letter to myself four years ago and saying, okay, dude, you're going to start doing uh, media on LinkedIn. Um, the first thing I do is forget about video. Um, it takes too long to shoot you're going to be competing and people are going to look at it. Now there are people listening to this that are going to say, yeah, but I see Gary V on a phone or I see uh, Branson on a phone, but dude, they're an already established brand. Yeah. You're trying to build a brand, right? So that's one. Number two is you've got to be an expert in the area you're working. Now you just need to be an expert in either the industry or the specialty. Like if you're software engineers, but you work multiple industries, you need to know what to say to that software audience, right? Via what we call, there's two ways to do that. One is long form, we're writing articles. And I think right now I've got like 130 articles online um, and that adds um, major gravitas, but it takes time. And then we use breadcrumbs, which are very short. It's 1300 characters and you can usually post a picture on, on there that's relevant to it. Do not use stock photos. Invest in a good couple hundred dollar camera that shoots super good quality um, uh, photos and start branding yourself. It's going to seem weird. It's going to seem egotistical, but people want to know what you look like, how you look like as you give out this information that's going to be valuable. And look, eventually the market's going to say you suck. Or they're going to say you have something interesting to say. But either way, it's going to take time. If you suck, here's the good news. You once sucked at everything you're great at today. You just didn't quit. 
Um, the long form piece interests me. It's a uh, so I was I was trying to work out how to go about that myself, and I I, I find myself uh, I find myself going oh god there's a lot of work here, so I started creating a content map on 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 what I'd like once a week, and then I, I was writing down like topical things that I could do, and then I went reviewing all my statements as well, and before I knew it. I had a list of everything that I wanted to say for next year, but there's an incredible amount of work. Did How were you able to get your content writer to write in your own voice? Oh, I write everything myself. Nobody's ever put out one word on my behalf. Every single, I write every single posting. Nobody's ever put out anything, single word ever that you've seen me put online, ever. Okay. All right. So, so that, uh, that, so, so a large part of your day now is creating content. No, I, I work a desk. I'm the number one biller in my office. Um, I work, I, I this is going to sound corny. I've never fucking worked. I, I, I do four hours on Saturday and four hours on Sunday, Saturday and Sunday revolve primarily around content development for the upcoming week. Um, during the week, I'm in the office at 7 a.m., no later than that. Um, my team usually gets here at 7.30, meaning my entire organization. Um, I don't take lunch, work through lunch, and my agency fits content around me. Whenever I'm on the road, um, my director of photography is with me. He travels with me everywhere, flies with me, drives with me, trains with me, and we capture content wherever we are. We were just in L.A., San Francisco, and Boston over the last nine days. I probably walked out with, I don't know, you'll start seeing about 15 or 20 pieces of content come out online. Um, and then I write. I, I, I write in my voice. Um, I keep post-it notes next to my phone when I'm on the phone with clients or individuals. And we all do it. We think of something that went down on the phone call and like, fuck, that's an article right there. And I jot down the seven or eight or nine key words on the post-it. I slap it into my um, my notebook that goes everywhere with me, and that is the genesis of an article. And eventually, you get the arc of an article, and it always has to make it about a story on a phone call, on something that happened, and what does the audience take away from it? Hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, and, and your team are doing this as well. It isn't just you. It, is everybody like developing their own personal brand? Is that what is, are, are they kind of targeted on that as a business? Yeah. So my senior people who have been with me for a long time are having their own brands being developed. You'll see Holly Scott. You'll see Giovanni Loricella. You'll see Matt Kaufman. Uh, those are my senior people who've been with me for 23, 19, 18, 11 years. And then we don't work on branding on anybody in their first year or two. We let them focus on becoming a recruiter first. Okay. Um, and then the branding happens again. We never force it. We put it out there and we've got a team inside that gives guidance on the lessons learned with me. But my approach to branding is going to be a you know, lot different as a New York guy than a nice, blonde, beautiful Florida girl who just is absolutely lovely and salt of the earth, but knows recruiting as well as anybody in this audience. Um, we, we make sure that the voice um, is super comfortable on what you want to put out. Yeah. She's not going to be as salty as you are. <laughs> um, so, so when I look at this, and I've been putting a bit of thought into having had uh, David Stephen Patterson on the podcast and a few people who've, who've used his services, um, and I've had, I've, had a, I've had a few others as well. Um, is there something, like, when you're targeting who this, this is going to, I take it, given that you've been in the same industry for a while, are you using a lot of the data that you've collected over the years in terms of all the candidates and clients within your niche? And are you then using paid traffic to get the content to them through other channels? So um, great question. Uh, as of recent, it was always organic. I, I never believe in paid, right? Because my, my philosophy is, is you want to get the individuals in the marketplace to follow you. Fuck the clients, fuck the companies. Because once you have the masses following you, the clients and companies have to write you the checks. And so the first thing you do is all of your content should be indexed towards the individuals in the marketplace. 
And once you do that, it doesn't matter if you've been in a market for one day or 30 years. Let me, let me just make sure I give you a footnote on that. Knowledge of the market, that will matter. But how you position and how you deploy your content doesn't matter. Human beings are human beings. They take in content the same way, right? You have to, you have to inform, educate, uh, and entertain. And so you have to make sure that your voice is entertaining enough unless you're absolutely a um, industry expert already and people are willing to listen to you. So I, I would be, I, I would, I would say we just started on paid. Um, and here's what I like about paid. If I want to get to the VP of marketing in a widget company, and there are 42 widget companies, I would put out a piece of content. I would call up my team and say, okay, let's go shoot this. And again, if you're listening to this and you don't have a video team, you can say, I'm going to write a very specific article about widgets. And then you can go on LinkedIn and you can go paid and you could make sure that that article or that posting ended up on that VP of widget marketing's desk in the 42. And you can do that for two, three, four weeks in a row. And if your content is good enough, he or she will read it and potentially respond to you. Um, or you do it four, five, six, seven times, and eventually you figure out how to get in front of that person with a phone call. That's all content does, but your content has to be good to get their attention. And when you're doing that, are, are you using multiple channels to retarget them? So like, are you, are you posting on LinkedIn, you're spreading that, are you then retargeting on Facebook or YouTube or, or, is, or, or do you have a science behind that? Yeah, so I will retarget. So I, I will go after the VP of market, uh, widget marketing. I would then find out their names in particular. I would then tag them in another posting I had, even in the comment line. So they're like, who the heck is ta targeting me? <laughs> oh, it's Bob Smith. But isn't that the guy or that, isn't that the girl? Right, I would do that. Um, I would name their company in another one. So you want to get multiple shots on goal that eventually you have their attention. Now, what you do after you get their attention really falls within how good of a headhunter you are, right? So that's, that's really important to understand. In regards to other retargeting, I believe LinkedIn is the only platform because our brains are wired that way. Mm -hmm. I think Facebook and Instagram are a waste of time. That is escapism platform that if somebody's pitching me for a job on there, I'm either escapism on Instagram looking at pretty pictures or on Facebook I'm looking at my cousins or my school chums or family. The second you start to solicit me from a job on there, my brain is not engaged in that. But when I'm on LinkedIn, I have my job chin strap on and I don't mind being engaged there intelligently. And in the same way, I don't want to see stupid videos about puppies or kittens either. So you have to understand the psychology when you're trying to deliver your message that it's the same human being, but they're engaged differently on the content they're going to take in on the platform they're playing on. Yeah, no, that, uh, that makes sense. But I, I suppose there's, there's also an argument that says that if you are retargeting on Facebook, it, it's not done with the same piece of media. Maybe there's something else that you can do to keep your brand in front of them on there. So like I would do a lot of sure. international recruitment. So it might be a destination based article that would that, that yeah. would hit their news yeah. feed that isn't like, oh, here's my job, come and come and approach. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, and it's a couple there. It's a it's a couple different avenues. Not everything's the same, right? To me, that's more like a broad stroke mm -hmm. of keeping the brand. But if I'm gonna throw a dart or I'm gonna have a sniper rifle, my sniper rifle is always deployed on LinkedIn. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I haven't used any paid thing. Uh, ever so i'm i'm really just at the start of the journey of of exploring it right now um today i wouldn't do paid first i i, I would build up a body of work because here's why mm. if you don't have a body of work that you've already put in play and you do paid and they come to look at you and there's nothing there other than you spent six bucks on their click you got nothing yeah so you've got to make sure that you've got a body of work they're like god damn it this guy knows about you know, automobiles or, you know, CC++ or certain programmers. Wow, mm -hmm. look, he or she knows what they're talking about. I may take their call if they ever do call. Yeah, the, this guy had Joe Mullings on the podcast. He must be a big deal. <laughs> so, uh, um, okay. That leads me to 
a question a lot of business owners have. How, how, can, how can we implement this strategy but keep recruiters hungry and make sure that they're still doing the traditional activities, especially younger people who are, who are getting into the industry? How can we make sure they're not getting too distracted by digital media and, and, it, and, and it is, in, in fact, taking away from their ability to do their job right? Well, first of all, you know, so there's a couple answers to that. The first answer is make sure you're hiring the right people, right? Um, if, if, if you're hiring somebody and you can't figure out in the interview that they get easily distracted by the career squirrel or the work squirrel, um, then that falls on you. It's not their fault. You're the one who hired them. Number two is you need to explain to them how does your process work, right? My people know that the top of the funnel gets filled up in a classic recruiting firm with A, B, and C calls, right? That, that's what our desk looks like. A calls are red hot calls. B calls are, man, maybe they heard of you. C is they're ice cold. So I explain our digital strategy is here to make sure that we load up the top of your funnel with no C calls, primarily B and A calls. And I do that by building the brand around the company, building the brand around me, building the brand around you. So even if you never spoke to me before, but I reach out to you and you know me because of the hard work we've put in on content, that is an automatic A call most of the time. They're like, hey, Joe, I feel like I know you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that becomes a much more powerful call. I get to a point of gravitas and leverage in that phone call a lot quicker. Now, start to compound that over if you can make 60 calls a day and I've eliminated C calls and now they're primarily B and A calls and I explain this physics to the new person, all media does is change the level of the call from C to B and B to A. It doesn't replace the call. So if you're going to get pulled into the rabbit hole or chase the squirrel of media, this is not the job for you. And we'll see that very quickly. And I can't not do a business model that makes total sense and has been proven out because I'm afraid somebody's going to be distracted. They're going to be distracted by a Playboy magazine or a Sports Illustrated magazine or their phone that they can watch multimedia on anyway, even if I'm not using that in my business model. That's a, that's a, that's a detailed answer. Um, makes sense. And a couple of rapid fire questions. What things do you think separate top performers from average recruiters? Um, intelligence and work ethic. Okay. Um, if you were to do your business over again, what would you do differently? Um, this is going to bother some people. I wouldn't do a single thing differently because all the things I quote unquote did wrong were the things I learned the most from. And so therefore, there's no possible way for me to end up where I am today if I did everything right. <laughs> um, why does our industry have a problem in keeping hold of its best people? Because most of the industry indexes towards staring at a telephone taking a roll of tape and taping the telephone to somebody's head and giving them zero career growth, zero personal growth, and zero reason to be proud of a market that they're in. Most people who go to a fucking bar when they ask what they do, they're afraid to say they're a headhunter. They make up some other bullshit explanation, and it's because the owner of that organization has not made it a, 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 a business that has people grow, has people create, and have, and have it be smarter than the owner. Most of the owners in this industry are so afraid of having somebody smarter than them that they avoid them or they create an environment that that no longer pays dividends on. How do you inspire millennials? Millennials are interesting. Um, and I don't, my, my job is not to inspire anybody because that, that, that has a shelf life on it. I find inspired millennials. And then all I do is give them the gas to keep throwing it on their own flame. If I've got to motivate somebody, then I, I made a wrong hire again. So I find inspired millennials. Look, I, I hired a fucking 64-year-old fucking guy uh, a year ago, and he's one of the most driven guys in my organization. I got a whole bunch of people in their early 20s. 
They're outworking any other 40-year-old or 35-year-old I've seen. It's hiring the right people. Joe Mullins, thank you so much. You bet. Pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with my uh, my professional uh, allies on the other side of the on the other side of the pond. Fantastic. Loved every second of it. Take care. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Well, a massive thank you to Joe for coming on the podcast. What a smart guy. What an intense individual. And how impressed am I with his business? I love that he's figured out a way to create an inbound solution, but yet keep the traditional activities of using the phone, headhunting, and he's managed to find a balance within that. Now, it'll be interesting to see in hiring the next generation if the same will be true or if recruitment will change. But for now, it seems like he's found the right balance and the results are there. So lots of takeaways from from that interview in how he goes about it. One of the things I like, and I think everybody could take it away, is whenever you're having a conversation with somebody or something happens in a process or, or whatever it is, you know, document that and then that there can become a blog. And I do a little bit of that myself and I find that I find that sometimes those posts are the most engaging and get the most uh, the most feedback. So we'll be back later in the week with another guest. Hope you're all enjoying the podcast. We're getting tons of listens at the moment. So really happy and enjoying recording them and if you are just let us know and if you want to come on the show as a guest no matter if you're joe mullings or you're joe soap i don't mind just want to talk recruitment if you've got some interesting ideas and a good story let's have you on all right till next time take care the podcast you just heard was made using anchor ever thought about making your own podcast anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.